And the church said, Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for our workers' training tonight. Thank you for your faithful people. Thank you for your obedient people. We're asking, Lord, that this work of yours will prosper in every one of our hands in Jesus' name. Amen. Teach us, Lord. Make us teachable and help us to follow the teaching of your word and also pass across the faithful word as we have been taught in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Good, good, amen. Thank you very much. You can sit down. Tonight we're looking at First Timothy chapter 6 from verse 6 to verse 12. Let's start with verse 6. It says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. Please understand, it's talking about material things. It's talking about food and raiment. It's talking about the care of the body, the cover of the body, the nourishing of the body. It's talking about the shelter we have, the clothing we have, the material things we have. And it says in that respect, godliness with contentment is great gain. Look at that word, contentment. Contentment does not mean passivity. There are people who are passive. They don't think forward. They don't plan. They don't have any goal in life. They're just passive. It doesn't talk of godliness or passivity. There are people who are lazy. And they say, I'm content. I'm satisfied with what I have. It's not talking about godliness with laziness. There are people who are lukewarm. And because uh, they, don't, they don't have any energy, spiritual energy, there's no drive, there's no passion, there is no go-getting attitude with them, they are just lukewarm. And Jesus said, because you are neither cold nor hot, but lukewarm, I will spill thee out of my mouth. It's not talking about godliness with lukewarmness. It's not talking about being stagnant. There are people who are stagnant. They are just there. Where they were yesterday is where they are today. And if they are not careful, that's where they will be next year in a decade because they are just stagnant. It's not talking about godliness with stagnancy. We should move forward. It says godliness with contentment. Contentment in material things. Contentment in physical things. Godliness with contentment is great gain. There's another side to this. There are people who are content without godliness. They turn it around. But understand, contentment without godliness is great loss. There are people who don't have the grace of God in their lives. The grace that brings us to salvation and the faith that brings us to salvation. Now, uh, contentment without grace, without faith, without salvation is a great loss there are people that do not have any spiritual growth in their lives you look at their lives they're not growing they say i'm saved and i'm okay i'm saved and i'm satisfied now contentment without spiritual growth is a great loss and there are people who think that if we're passionate, if we're zealous in the things of God, that is being contentment. Here comes Caleb, and Caleb approached Joshua, and he said, I am 80 and five years old. Give me this land, because I'm still strong today as I was when Moses gave me the land. The promises of God he has made to us. We need to be zealous about them. In fact, it says we're redeemed from all iniquity. And then he purifies unto himself peculiar people, zealous of good works. Our zeal should not be cancelled. Our zeal should not be buried just because, well, I, I'm being content. I'm content with what I have now. What you have physically, materially, yes, but 
spiritually uh, you cannot just sit down there and say now I am growing older and because I'm growing older I'm going to be content whatever I have done that is enough Caleb said no the promise he has given me look at my age now yet I am still pursuing God called Joshua and he said Joshua you are getting old in fact you are old but the land to be possessed is still much it wasn't telling him to sit down now on the rocking chair and say i am content no joshua you have to divide the land the whole land to the people the contentment is talking about is the food you have don't be a glutton just eat enough to keep you healthy is saying as you take care of your body little sleep moderate sleep don't sleep too too much so that because sleeping too much has it's so negative uh, it's so negative impact to you on the body make it moderate that's what he's talking about and then when you wear clothes the clothes that are appropriate when it's hot when you're in the tropics when you're in the cold when you're in the winter there are clothes that are appropriate for the weather and for each situation and it says be content with all those things but when it comes to the spiritual when it comes to soul winning here is paul the apostle is willing to spend and be spent even though he's done much more than all the apostles put together and yet he says i still have the eagerness i'll come to you those of you in rome because i am a debtor a debtor to the greek and the romans and the and the jews to keep on preaching and pushing the gospel here is john the beloved john the beloved was actually now about 95 96 years of age and the lord said in revelation chapter 10 that he will still preach he will still minister to nations and tongues and kindreds and many other places so it's not talking of laziness it's not talking of passivity it's not talking of lukewarmness it's not talking of stagnancy it's talking about material things godliness with contentment is great but contentment without godliness without grace without goodness without zeal without passion without soul winning without something to show that you're a worker you're a real christian and you are moving on and you are pursuing if you don't have that as a great loss we're talking tonight on graceful godliness and contentment without contention and uh, covetousness and we divided the message to three parts number one we're looking at godly contentment with essential remage and food essential remage and food of course food for remage and food for your children education for your children and shelter for the whole family physical things to take care of yourself take care of your wife take care of the family take care of everyone essential remain and food number two we're looking at a grievous uh, consequences of evil roots in focus when people have uh, uh, the love of money the love of material things and they abandon their soul they're not taking care of their soul but they are eager to have this and add this and build that and and do that when they have that in focus and they have the evil roots all kinds of roots they have that in focus there are grievous terrible consequences we're looking at number three number three is growing consecration for experiential righteousness of faith let's come to number one number one is godly contentment with essential remage and food as we look at this we're looking at first timothy chapter chapter six and we're reading from verse six it says but 
godliness with contentment is great gain. And look at uh, verse 7. In verse 7, it tells us, For we brought nothing into this world. It's talking about material things. We didn't bring, uh, you know, houses into the world or cement or, or whatever material things or clothing or raiment or garment or food. We didn't bring anything into this world and then it says it is certain we can carry nothing out you see he's talking about material things what we carry what we carry and he says we cannot carry the house out we cannot carry the institution out when we leave this world we cannot carry all the all the wardrobe we cannot carry that with us we cannot carry all the equipment in the kitchen our kitchen and all the food we cannot carry that out that's what he's talking about we carry salvation on. The salvation that he gives us as we close our eyes like this, it is that salvation that goes with us to heaven. We carry purity of heart, blessed at the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We carry that with us. We carry sanctification and holiness with us. Because you follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. We carry that with us. He's talking about material things. He's talking about, you know, the tangible, touchable things. And it says it is certain we can carry nothing out. Then it says in verse 8, in verse 8, and uh, having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Let us be there with satisfied the food we have. And you have to understand that food too. You have to look at your body. You have to examine your body. You have to understand your body and see the kind of food that will be appropriate for your body. Uh, sometimes the tongue alone cannot decide uh, what we eat. You know, the thing is so sweet, there's so much sugar, there's so much salt, and the tongue may like that, but the rest of the body may suffer because of too much salt, because of too much sugar, the rest of the body may suffer. And so, when you have the food, you look at the body, you understand your body, and you see the food that will match the health and the growth of your body. It says then, having food and raiment, let us be there with content, satisfied, and please actually when the lord supplies our need he supplies adequately he supplies abundantly matthew chapter 6 we're reading from verse 31 matthew chapter 6 verse 31 therefore take no thought that is don't be anxious over anxious and uh, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or where thou shall we be clothed he's still talking about food and raiment. It says in verse 32, in verse 32, for after all these things do the Gentiles seek. All these things only that's what the Gentiles, the Gentiles and the unbelievers and the sinners, they don't think about their soul. They don't think about their salvation. They don't think about grace. They don't think about godliness. They don't think about righteousness. They don't think about the thing that will sustain them here on earth and in heaven. They only think about the things of this world. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. The heavenly Father knows we have body, we have spirit, we have soul. The body is the external, is the external part of us, but the soul cannot have existence now here on earth without the body. And so the Father knows if our souls are going to live, if our souls are going to be properly taken care of, 
we need the body. Our spirit cannot give expression to anything. Our spirit cannot subsist, cannot exist here on earth without our body. So the heavenly Father knows how dependent on the body we are. The Father knows how dependent on a good body, a healthy body, a sound body that we have. So he knows that for our souls to remain intact, our spirit to remain intact, we need the body. And so the Father knoweth that ye have need of this thing. Look at verse 33. In verse 33 it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It says, Major on the major thing and minimize the minor in your life. The people that major on the minor, the body, the food, the raiment, the education, traveling abroad, doing this and doing that so that their subsistence, existence here on earth will be well taken care of. But as they travel, as they eat, as they feed, as they close themselves, they neglect their body. The parents that will do everything for their children to travel here, travel here, have education, but they do not find out what's the condition of life there, what's the possibility of remaining born again, real children of God there. They put first the raiment and the food. They put first the education and the things of the world, the things the people of the world value. That's what they exalt. But Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. There is a salvation in that kingdom. Seek that first. There is holiness, righteousness in that kingdom. Seek that first. And there is the power of the Holy Ghost and the assignment, the great commission we have in the kingdom. Seek that first. It says, seek ye first. Let it be foremost, let it be number one, let it be priority in your life, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. All these things shall be added. He didn't say he will add as much as the people of the world have. No. And they did go into excess. They have money, they cannot spend, they have food, they cannot eat. They have clothes they don't wear in five years. They have mansions they don't live in. They can't live in two houses. At the same time, he will give us what's appropriate for us. He says, as we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things appropriate, all these things adequate, he will add unto us. He will add unto you in Jesus' name. You will not lack. Say, I will not lack. He'll give us appropriate things and he'll give us adequate things. So we're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 8 and we're reading from verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 8, we're reading from verse 3. And he humbled thee and suffered thee, permitted thee to hunger and fed thee. Look at that. Permitted thee, suffered thee to hunger. Have you seen the children of Israel? Many people do not understand how God will do what he did for the children of Israel. Number one, he gave them the pillar of cloud. That to shelter them, to shade them from the sun. The sun is good, but when the sun, the heat of the sun becomes too much, it can cause some damage in the body too. And then he gave them the pillar of fire. The pillar of fire, it, they needed that in the wilderness, all the snakes, all the serpents, and all the wild animals. The heat of that pillar will drive them away. And then he showed them the way. He led them the way. Everything he did for them, everything was appropriate. Everything was adequate. And now we're told he suffered them to hunger. I, I, I think we ought to know that hunger sometimes is good for the body. Overeating is bad for the body. But hunger 
when the body feels hungry there are you know different parts of the body internally that will kind of uh, uh, improve because of that hunger uh, that's the reason why a real believer uh, will not eat every time he feels like eating there are times to fast there are times to wait upon the lord hunger that is part of the care of God upon our lives. Actually, um, you know, some kind of fasting, you know, there are different kinds of fasting. I, you know, we've learned that before. There's what we call intermittent fasting. That one, you get hungry over a period of time. And, um, you know, scientists tell us that we need that. Like you give, you have them each hour space that you eat and then 16 hours of the day the body is free from chewing and swallowing and this and that and that keeps you healthy and they tell us that intermittent fasting uh, having uh, if you eat at 11 o'clock in the morning and then at seven o'clock eight hour period they tell us that it does good in the body if you do that twice a week but for the believer real fasting once or twice a week will not hurt you will not harm you will actually make you healthy and he suffered them to hunger and then we're told he fed them with manna and which thou uh, new west not all their days in egypt they didn't have their manna why it was angels food it was what the angels fed on and and so they couldn't have got that in egypt but they got that at they were in the wilderness the lord will feed you in jesus name i like your amen he says that and, and that uh, he might uh, make the know that man does not live by bread only bread alone but by every word that cometh that proceedeth out of the mouth of god does man live it comes to spiritual again he fed you with manna that's for your body but he wants you to know that you live, your spirit lives, your soul lives, your inner man lives on the promises of God, on the precepts of God, on the promises and the prophecies of the word. He says we should not go without the word because that's how our soul feels and that's how our spirit feels. And so we balance up everything, raiment and food, all right, but make it moderate be satisfied and be content with just the one that is adequate for you it tells us the story of a man in luke chapter chapter 12 reading from verse 15 luke chapter 12 we're looking at verse 15 is and he said unto them take heed and beware of covetousness take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life consisted not in the things in in the abundance of the things which he possesses which he possesses that what possess 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 it's good for you to possess something but it's not good for that thing to possess you to possess you when we are possessed with material things we are now enslaved and we're ensnared by those material things we possess them good enough but when they possess us when we're obsessed with them and it's like i must have i must have some people are possessed with material things and it's not good for us but you possess something and your life is not based on all that you possess look at verse 16 now in verse 16 it says and he speak a parable unto them saying the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully plentifully now there's nothing wrong in that because i seek such that year and god gave him a hundredfold and he had 
plenty and Abraham also had plenty and so there's nothing wrong with having plenty you possess it but it doesn't possess you you're able to spend it you're able to give to the poor you're able to help the needy because you are not i cannot touch that thing it must reach a million i cannot touch that it must reach 10 million i can people are dying all around and yet i cannot touch that money it must reach i must become a millionaire what the use in becoming a millionaire when your relatives your wife your family members when they're dying when your children when they're suffering and when your neighbors are suffering the sin has possessed such people but he tells us uh, the field of this man brought forth plentifully look at verse 17 in verse 17 and he thought within himself it's good to think thoughtful people are progressive people but when you think within yourself and you don't put god into the into the thinking and God is not involved in what you are planning and thinking and strategizing. Put God into the equation of your life. Let him be the major constant in the equation of your life. But this man, he thought within himself and then he said, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to, disturb, to bestow my fruits. Think about that. I have no rooms. Yes, you have. That poor man there is one of the rooms. If you shift some of the things to him, you have room. That person that is starving in your neighborhood is part of the room. If you shift some of the things into that room, then you know you have enough room. That fellow that is penniless, living in penury, that's another room there. Why don't you shift some of the things that look at the needs in society, look at the needs of the brethren, look at the needs of your neighbors, and look at the needs all around, and say you don't have any, of course you have room. When you give to the poor, and you put some in that room, and you give to the widows and you put some in that room and you give to your neighbors you put some in that room you give to the penniless so, uh, to those who are suffering uh, with starvation you can do that and so you have enough room it's because you are trying to put everything in, uh, into one Ghana you're trying to put everything in, uh, into one uh, package over here in your place that's why you think you don't have enough room in verse 18 in verse 18 it says and he said this will I do I will pull down my bands and build greater and uh, there and there will I bestow all my goods and my fruits look at verse 19 in verse 19 there and i will say to my soul uh-huh the man remembered he has soul but it's not saying the right thing to his soul it says i will say to my soul thou hast much goods laid up for many years the man was going to die that night i was talking of many years the people who are not preparing for eternity all they know tonight all they know tomorrow all they know next year all they know is me my family and uh, my loved ones that's all they know and he says i'm going to live for many years take thine ease eat drink and be merry that's what the lord is telling us not to do is saying we should be satisfied with something moderate satisfied with what is good enough for the body at the moment the raiment and the food and now the lord said in verse 20 look at verse 20 it says but god said unto him thou fool is that only a fool who has three compartments body soul spirit and he provides only for one is that not a fool somebody who has body soul and spirit and the least important 
is the body. The most important is the spirit. And the next in importance is the soul. And it provides only for the body. And then it does not provide for the soul and the spirit. Is that not a fool? The person who provides for the moment, just today, is only what you see to eat today. That's what you have. And even today is a gift. Today is a gift. Uh, do, you, do you realize as we use language, we say present. When you say present, you are talking of today. When you say present, you are talking of a gift. And today is all the gift you are sure about. Today is the present hour, the present moment you are sure about. And the fellow who provides for the present and then for the long years of a hundred years, a thousand years and eternity, he has not provided. Is that not a fool? The person who labors and labors and labors for what he cannot carry away from here and it does not give a minute of uh, provision for the salvation for the holiness and for the purity of heart and life that you will carry to the great beyond only for the present is that not a fool the fellow does not know tomorrow and he's, he's talking about the unknown and he says for many many years that's a fool he's seen young people die he's seen older people die he's seen the people in his own in his own community die and he never thought it will happen to him not me not me not me I still have many years what he for he says thou fool this night thy soul shall be required of thee and then who shall those things be which thou hast provided and Jesus make the application in verse 21 one, verse 21, so is he that lays up treasure for himself, for himself, himself minus the poor, himself minus the needy, himself minus the neighbors, himself minus the all the people in need around him. Himself is only thinking of himself. He says so. Is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Rich towards man. Rich in the eyes of men, rich in the eyes of the world, rich in the eyes of the bankers, where he puts his money, but is not rich towards God. Spiritually, is penniless, and eternally, he is in penury. Nothing, not rich towards God. That's what the Lord is saying. We should be wise. I will be wise. You'll be wise in Jesus' name. We'll come to point number two now. Point number two, we're looking at grievous consequences of evil roots in focus. There, there, there are things that people focus on in this life, and the Lord wants us to focus on things spiritual. But look at the grievous consequences of evil roots in focus he tells us in first Timothy chapter 6 and I'm reading from verse 9 it says but they that will be rich he says they fall into temptation and a snare look at the world in which you are living you want to be rich as rich as so and so he is in the world. You don't know what they do. You don't know the maneuvering they get into. You don't know the politics of wealth. There's the politics of wealth that, you know, you have to cut this, pay this, wait this, bribe this, go through this before you get to that other side. It's a network, a vicious network 
of uh, politics. The people go, I'm not talking of the politics governing the country, I'm talking of the maneuvering, the things the people do before they get all that you don't know, and then you want to be as rich as they are, and they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful laws which drown men into, into, um, into destruction and perdition. Destruction and perdition. Look at verse 10. In verse 10 it says, For the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money. We need to understand. You can have money without loving money excessively. It's like the love of money, you're married to the money. The money is your life. The money is your dream. The money is your joy. Not even the use of the money, not even the spending of the money, the money itself is the real thing and uh, you, you embrace it you engage it you, you marry it you are in love with it and as it's growing uh, you're happy even if you are starving even if you are not feeding well even if you are not clothing yourself very well even if you are not spending it the way you ought to spend it to take care that's why money is money is profitable to take care of ourselves but he can't do that. He lost the money and he's taking care of the money. He's uh, patching the money. He's, uh, he lost after the money. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. That's what it means. All kinds of evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. They have erred from the faith. And you see money and the pursuit of money and the love of money takes people away from the faith. When it takes them away from the study of the word, it's taking them away from the faith. When it takes them away from the fellowship, of faithful people is taking them away from the faith. When he takes them away from application of the word of God, he wants to get the money, he's uh, trying to strike a deal and they say, get this done, get this done. And he doesn't remember, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer. And doing that will compromise my stand. He doesn't remember that. He still claims I am in the faith. And yet all the deals he's making, they're eroding into his faith. They're eroding into his faithfulness. And it says some have converted after that money. And they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows many sorrows eventually they, by the time they get to the end of the road faith is gone salvation has leaked out honesty does not remain holiness is no more there following after the lord with the zeal of the earlier years all those things are no more there again and little by little, idolatry has come in. Little by little, the people are telling him, they are telling her, uh -huh, you want to use us to make money? This is how we got the money. And we have covenant. And you are standing back, you are saying, I'm a faith man. I'm a believing man, uh-huh, okay. This is what we did before we had it. And if you're not even bent a little, it's give and take. You want to take this, you give a little, you bend a little, but you are so rigid and you are so firm. So you cannot have what you are thinking you have. And when the money comes in focus, when the position 
comes in focus. When the prosperity comes in focus, the fellow says, okay, 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 um, you know, I'll pray, God will forgive me. And all. they are sinking and sinking and sinking into destruction and perdition. God deliver us in Jesus' name. And look at Second Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 15. In Second Peter chapter 2, we're looking at verse 15, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray. And it says, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozo, who loved, loved, loved the wages of righteous unrighteousness. You know, at the beginning, Balaam said, go tell Bela, if he will give me half of his house full of silver and gold, look at my face, you're looking at an uncompromising man, I will not go beyond the word of the Lord. And so they went back. And Balak, Balak knows the nature of man. You can say that, but when you see the money, when you see the silver and the gold, so he sent them back and he said, you're missing a great breakthrough. Whatever you've got, that you are going to get what you have never seen in your life. Okay, he said, stay there. Let me go and pray. And God said, Balaam, you want to go? Go. And he didn't say, God, did you mean that? Because you told me the other time not to go. But you are now saying, go. He didn't even ask question. And so he saddled his ass and his servant. He was going on the way. On the way. He had become spiritually blind. He didn't see the angel with the sword. The ass had more vision, more revelation than the prophet had. And so the ass turned this way, turned that way. And he beat the ass. And God opened the mouth of the ass. Why are you beating me that way? And because he didn't even have, it was, he wasn't sure that the ass was talking. The goal and the drive for the riches blindfolded him and sometimes in our lives when you have material things in focus when you have the gain in focus when you have the progress the prosperity in focus you are blinded to the things you should have considered and eventually uh, god opened his eyes and he saw the angel and he said, why are you beating your ass? I would have killed you and spared the ass. I didn't know you were there. I'm so sorry. Now, if it displeases you, I will turn back. You will see you seen Eve. The thing blocked his brain and blocked his mind. You know, in life, when you have something you are gunning for, you have something you are driving for, you have something you want to have, by all means, your thinking faculty is eroded. And your mind is also eroded. And the sharpness you used to have, you'll not have that anymore. Because the love of what you are running after is taking the better part of you. And we're told he loved the wages of unrighteousness. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, but he was rebuked for his iniquity. It was already a backslider. You already had iniquity. You already had transgression because he had forsaken the way of righteousness because of the love of money. And then it says, the dumb ass speaking with man's voice. For but the madness of the prophet, he was mad. Uh, mad is not talking about being angry here. He was mad in his pursuit money. Balak has something for me. I cannot wait to get to him. And whatever he wants me to do, curse the people that God has said you must not curse. Whatever he wants me to do, I 
will do. He couldn't sleep at night. He was thinking, when I get to him, what I'll do, what I'll say, how I'll comport myself, the madness of the prophet. Verse 17, in verse 17, these are wells without water. The water has all leaked out. Clouds that are Courage weighs a tempest. It was like, you know, his mind, his feeling, his emotion. He was being driven beyond himself. And so speedy, he wanted to get to the place in good time. And then it says, for whom the blackness, the mist of the darkness is reserved forever. The Lord keep us from everything like that in Jesus' name. And the Lord preserve us for eternity and for the goodness of the Lord in our lives in Jesus' name. We're coming now to point number three. Point number three, we're looking at growing consecration for experiential righteousness. Growing consecration that we turn our eyes away from the money, the material things in this world. Please understand. God gives us money. God blesses our lives, and the labor of the uh, of the labor of the rich may not allow them to sleep, but God gives good sleep to a laboring man. We're looking at First Timothy chapter six, and we're reading from verse eleven. It says, "But thou, O man of God, thou." O woman of God, thou, O child of God, flee these things. They will come as temptation. Money coming from the wrong source, coming from the wrong trade, coming from the wrong angle. Money will come, but you'll find out, is this from the Lord? that maketh rich and addeth no sorrow? Or is this from the other side to trip us and to make us fall when we find out it's from the tempter? Then we run from that, flee these things. Like, uh, you know, like Joseph Fletch. Uh, somebody may grab you and say, I know much religion has made you inconsiderate. We're telling you, you can have this, you can have this and that. And you're saying, no, no, no. And then, like the wife of Potiphar grabbed the, um, the clothes of Joseph. They may grab you and say, whether you like it or not, okay, you don't want to do the covenant ways. Uh, you know, all those uh, things will do the covenant for you. Just give us the money. They grab you and they say, you must because... They love you so much and they want you to be drowned in their lust for money. But you are the one to flee. You are the one to say, no, don't sacrifice for me. Don't pay any money, blood money for me. Don't go into any covenant for me. I don't want it. I'm a child of God. I am satisfied and content with whatever God gives me. You must flee every appearance of evil. Thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, perseverance, meekness. Look at verse 12. And then it says, fight the good fight of faith. We've been talking about, uh, you know, some words we need to understand. That the other week, maybe last uh, Saturday, I was explaining anger. Be ye angry and sin not, and then let all bitterness, clamor, malice, and anger be put away from you. I need to explain this to you. Fight. Fight the good fight of faith. The greatest fight we have is to fight self. The greatest fight we have is there's something inside us. After hearing the word of God, hearing the word of God, hearing the word of God over and over, there is still something on the inside. 
that is pulling us to the way of destruction and perdition fight sell there is something in that is still uh, you know drawing us from the inside and that one is a personal sin in the thinking we have the thinking that goes the wrong direction okay abraham was rich why can't i well abraham was rich but he told the king of sodom i will not take from a shoe to a string from what you are giving me lest thou should say you made abraham rich and so we will not consider all those things and the thing is seen in our mind in our thinking after all there is um, you know the promise of god god will supply all your needs yes 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 all your needs not all your wants all your needs according to his riches in glory by christ jesus he, so, he supplies everything we need but he does not supply what will destroy us and so we must balance up everything you fight self and you fight all the eagerness now 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 I must fight that that's fighting the good fight of faith the faith that wants to be destroyed in your life the faith that wants to be relegated to the second to the third to the last point at the queue you fight against that that faith I'm going to hold fast the faith because Jesus said when the Son of Man cometh shall he find faith in your heart and if your heart is dropping the faith and your heart is slowing down on the faith and now there's coming a replacement you fight whatever will relegate faith to the background in your personal life that the greatest fight we're not fighting the brothers we're not fighting the sisters we're not fighting the church we're not fighting our neighbors we're fighting the tendency to make us derail from the faith and if somebody has derailed from the faith and is doing something that will provoke you to also go along with him and derail from the faith you're not fighting him because if you're fighting him you leave the real fight you ought to fight you're fighting yourself wanting to get angry with the man you're fighting yourself, wanting to forget the line of action you ought to be taking. You're fighting yourself that wants you uh, to leave the faith and then to follow after irrelevant things. It says uh, that to us that we fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. Where, where unto thou hast also been called and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. Have you professed that you are saved? Fight for that to keep it. Are you professing? Have you professed before many people you are sanctified? Fight to keep that. Uh, somebody, a strange woman, uh, has contact with you one way or the other and then uh, there's a tendency there the pool to go near that strange woman you're not fighting the woman you're fighting the pool inside you you're fighting uh, the drawing towards that that will make you to forget yourself and forget that without holiness no man shall see the lord may the lord help us in jesus name uh, there was uh, one man in the Bible, you know his story, Gehazi. Neman had come and he had offered much money and change of raiment to Elisha. Elisha said, No, there's a healing, divine healing is not for sale. He pleaded and he pleaded and Elisha refused and then Neman went. All of a sudden, there was that pool inside Gehazi. That says, my master Elisha has allowed this man to go like this. I will run out of time. That pursuit, that's what we fight. I will run after him. That eagerness, 
is what we find. The difference between us and Elisha. Elisha obeying the voice and the word of the Lord. And we seeing what, what he lost in this. I will run after. That's the love of money. That is the thing we fight. We're not fighting Elisha for taking his stand. We're not fighting Naaman for carrying the thing away. And then Gehazi got there and said, you have to tell a lie before you can get what Elisha has already refused. My master just he had visitors now and he says, I shall come after you and get this and that. Oh, be satisfied. Be content to take tomb. And this, he carried everything. They actually carried for him. It was much that himself alone could carry. Think about that. When you pursue things in this world that is too much for you alone to carry. When you have all the kind of love, love for material things and love for money and love for men and love for women that is too much for you to carry. And then they had to carry it for him and then he came innocently with a placid face. That man was a dramatic. He knew how to dramatize. And Elisha said, where have you been? Oh, master, I've been nowhere. I've been here. And Elisha said, did not my heart go with you? When the love for material thing drew you, and you didn't fight that, and you didn't overcome that. And now you said, the leprosy of Naaman come upon you and your descendants forever and ever. Fight that thing, so that the forever judgment of God does not come upon you. I pray the Lord deliver every one of us in Jesus' name. We're looking at Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 6. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, it says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. If there's anything we ought to thirst for, not their money, We'll have enough ones, we'll have raiment and food, let that, be, let that satisfy you. But blessed are they which thirst and hunger after righteousness, for they shall be filled. The Lord fill you with righteousness in Jesus' name. And then it tells us in verse 8, it says, Blessed are the pure in heart. When our heart is pure, it will not displace Christ that sits on the throne of our heart. Christ wants to be in our heart without a rival. He wants to live in our heart without a rival. And when our heart is pure, there'll be no rivalry. There'll be no competition or something in our heart. And then Christ being there, blessed at the pure in heart, for they shall see God on the final day we will see God in Jesus' name. Now, we'll be talking of righteousness, righteousness, righteousness. What is righteousness? R is the reconciliation of our will with his will. That's righteousness, not my will, but thine be done. But when our will goes away and strays away and flies off from the will of God, there's no righteousness. God says, this is my will for you. This is my plan for you. Uh-uh, God, that's too small. I want at this, at this, at that. When a will flies away, goes away, departs, from the will of God, we're no more righteous. Righteousness is reconciliation of our will to his will. And then I there is integrity despite bodily weakness. Uh, look at Job. His body was ravaged with pain, weak. And he was like rolling on the earth in the dust. Yet, with the bodily weakness, he held onto his integrity. Have I lost my job and I still hold to my integrity? That's righteousness. 
do I, am I still expect him more so that I can feed with food convenient for me? And yet I hold on to my integrity. That is righteousness. Righteousness is integrity that is held on to despite bodily weakness. G is godliness. The godliness that we have day by day with watchfulness. Uh, we're looking at, you know, that uh, godliness, but it's like a snowball. And if the sun shines on it and we don't protect it, it will evaporate. It will melt away. The godliness we have, that everywhere we are, you are in the marketplace, we are watching over that godliness. So that day by day, it does not evaporate. It does not go away. And you don't compromise. And the godliness is there, whatever the weather in the day, whatever the season of the time, godliness day by day with watchfulness each is honesty at work that's righteousness i go to my place of work and as i get to the place of work and i'm intent serious about keeping the righteousness it means i'll be honest in filling in what's in the book i'll be honest in writing the time i go to the place of work i'll be honest right that's righteousness and in answering answering a query that you said why this why that everything you know to be a fact that you give that's the righteousness honesty at the place of work t is truthfulness in our words truthfulness in our words and sometimes when we speak too often too quickly we, we talk thoughtlessly but when you think before you utter a word they ask a question don't allow pressure uh, let me think through okay this is the answer i have to give you ah, this answer will implicate you this answer will implicate so and so that's the truth i know that's righteousness righteousness it's truthfulness in our words righteousness e is earnestness in the defense of his word we have his word and we mix what you know many people of you know uh, different shades of christians this one is a yellow christian this one is a black christian this one is uh, you know a kind of um, circumstantial christian this one is a white christian all the shades and the colors of christians will meet yet where I mean the Christian is a disciple of Christ and we're honest in defending his word. We are honest in the word of God and they know you for who you are, anywhere you are, anywhere you go, that's righteous. Righteousness, oh, is obedience without willfulness. Obedience without a kind of, okay, uh, I've been too soft, I've been too nice. I mean, you know, to a kind of patient and peaceful, I think I need to, you know, show them some hard stuff. No, that's not righteousness. Righteousness is you continue to be obedient without willfulness. And you is uprightness in every way. Uprightness in every way. Anywhere I find myself, anywhere you find yourself, whatever is happening, there whatever you lose whatever you gain it's not the important thing anyway any place you find yourself the important thing is to stand up stand up for jesus christ the soldiers of the cross and remain upright in every way as there is separation from the ways of the world separation from the ways of the world that you know in the world now uh, they want us to you know cut little corner don't be so rigid and uh, you can bend a little and you can you know give us what you want a little and and don't after all uh, you know look at the those of us who are all here uh, what's your name uh, sir is peter 
What's your name, madam? Is uh, Miriam. And what's your name? Is Stephen. You see, and I am. Yeah, the, he is God doing. And you know, they, they talk. And well, Christians say, do you think we are pagans? <laughs> I don't. I'm not condemning you. I'm not thinking about who you are. Who you are not, but I'm separating from the ways of the world. I know this, I discern this to be the way of the world. And whatever you recommend, whatever other people recommend, I stand with the Lord and you separate from the ways of the world. Because pure religion and a defile before God is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in the affliction and to keep yourself separate unspotted from the world. Ye adulterers and ye adulteresses know ye not that the fellowship, the friendship of the world is enmity with God whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And it says love not the world and the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him because the pride of life and of the loss of the flesh, all these are not of God, they have the world, but not of God. And whosoever doeth the will of God abideth forever. And any is non conformity to any form of worldliness, non conformity, non conformity, uh, politics that's worldliness, and all the things they do, the maneuvering, everything. Uh, we know them. Uh, this one is worldliness. It's not only the painting, not only the palming, not only the hearing. Go, yes, that's part of it, but the real thing that the people of the world do so that they can make what they can make each in life. All those things we totally separate from. Uh, them that uh, he is expression of faithfulness in our work in our work we are faithful to the lord faithful to the to the lord all the time that is righteousness and then uh, as here is standing out without wavering standing out without wavering they will insult you they will blackmail you they will say unprintable things about you, but you do not waver. You still stand out with what you know to be right. That's righteousness as a steadfastness in our willingness under his will under his control that's what the lord has called us to and by his grace he'll keep us righteous all the days of our lives in jesus name amen, amen. in little things and big things he'll keep you righteous in jesus name and when the lord shall come for his own you will be part of his own and when the saints go marching in when the saints go marching in lord your count your people here all your people here in that number in jesus name let's rise up and talk to the lord in prayer now let's rise up talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, we've heard your word today. I want to stay and abide with your word. The Lord bless you and the Lord answer your prayer and the Lord's cut out and, ex and expunge and extract everything that is the root of evil from your life, from our lives in Jesus' name. Open your mouth and pray. It will supply your need, uh, satisfies you with appropriate raiment, appropriate, uh, adequate raiment, adequate food, and adequate cover, adequate shelter. He'll provide, he'll provide, he'll supply your needs. It's not going to supply what we covet, you supply our need. And then you run away from the root of evil. Let him root ground you in his will, in his word, and help you to flee all the things that the world may be using to drag you down, to pull you to themselves, and make you established in righteousness your will 
reconciled to the will of God. Integrity. Even when you have challenges and you still remain with your integrity, godliness, that you do not allow the people of the world, the things of the world, to sway you from that godliness. Honesty. You remain honest every time. Honest every time. Honest every time. Whatever they do, whatever they say, whatever they take, whatever they give, whatever they don't give. Honesty. Truthfulness. True every time. You're true to yourself. You're true to your neighbor. You're true everywhere, every time. Earnestness in the defense of the word. Earnestly. Contending for the faith was delivered unto the saints. Obedience. Obedience. The Spirit of God is in you. The Word of God is in you. And you are obedient to that in every way. Uprightness. The Lord make you upright. Not falling to their idol. Not falling to their idea. Separate from the ways of the world non-conformity to any form of worldliness and you express your faith and faithfulness in the way you walk in the world you stand out you stand out let your light so shine before men. They'll see your good work. They'll see your godly action. They'll glorify your Father who is in heaven. You are steadfast. Your willingness under his will. The Lord help you to stand having done all to stand and to show forth his righteousness anywhere everywhere you go in the world father we thank you today for your word we pray that this word will do good in every one of our hearts in jesus name we trust you we depend on you. We have faith in you. You will provide all the needs of your people without, uh, without any lack in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray you protect us as well. Not to fall to the temptation of the people of the world. Help us standing, standing, standing firm all the days of our lives in Jesus' name. These roots of evil, all kinds of evil, caught away, uproot from every life in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray the grace to remain righteous, the grace to be firm in righteousness, practical righteousness, righteousness at home, righteousness in the office, righteousness at work righteousness on the way righteousness in the world the grace to remain righteous through and through grant to all your children in jesus name lord as we get to the house fellowship as we get to our local churches and we teach the same word we pray that your word will bear fruit in the hearts of all our hearers in Jesus name righteousness today righteousness tomorrow righteousness forever righteousness in our heart righteousness in our homes righteousness till your people get to heaven in Jesus name make us righteous keep us righteous help us to keep on growing in righteousness you have answered our prayer thank you lord in jesus mighty name we pray